It's our 73rd lesson. We're on the last chapter of the book. And we probably have two or three more lessons that we'll be through with the book. <clears throat> now, in this lab, uh, Marion Fox is instructing me using my second edition of my flood book, the biblical flood. We're looking at the scientific method and we'll have to look at it first and, and understand it in more detail. And the FFM, that's Fox Flood Model, I shortened it. That's what I mean by FFM. We'll first look at the scientific method as a whole and try to understand how it operates because a lot of people don't understand the method. And we'll look at evaluating scientific explanations. So we'll evaluate some of the explanations. Look at geology and we'll see that it's based upon historical evidence. And we'll, as we define this, we'll elaborate on it in more detail. This lesson tonight won't have any Bible in it, it's just laying a groundwork for us to evaluate my model from a, from a scientific standpoint. We'll, we'll get back to it in the next lesson, we'll make application of it. It's been written to give an explanation of the flood account Genesis 6 or 9, my treatise was written with that purpose. So to keep that in the background. And the model that I have chosen, that I have uh, derived uh, from my interpretation of the Bible, and that's uh, what the Bible says. And of course, uh, I've, I've started with that premise that the Bible is God's word and it's infallible. Based upon that premise, then I've derived a model from what the Bible actually says and what we see in nature and the laws of science that have been learned from science. Now, I want to use a book by Kobe. Uh, it's a logic book, and it also has the scientific method discussed in it. And I would say that would be a good book to purchase if you can find a copy. It's had several editions, and I would I would suggest you get the latest edition, probably. Copy wrote an explanation is a group of statements, so now I'm going to explain. This is going to be my explanation, see. So it's a group of statements uh, or a story from which the thing to be explained can logically be inferred, and whose assumption removes or diminishes the problematic or puzzling character. So it, it removes some puzzles or, or problems. It solves some problems. Right? Not saying it solves every problem, but it solves some problems. He goes on and says, of course, the inference of the fact as conclusion from the explanation as premise might have to be enthematic, enthematic, enthematic. Now, what this means is this is an incomplete argument that we have to supply the part of the argument that's understood. And he explains that where the understood additional premises. I see he's the discussed enthymemes, and he's discussed some already in the book before we get to this. And I'll be covering this in the logic course that we start in January, the Lord willing. Where the understood additional premises may be generally accepted cause of laws. So there may be just laws that we see out there in nature. Or the conclusion may follow from with, with probability rather than deductively. So we may deal with probability. A probability can be very high or it can be just moderate. Uh, so we deal with different degrees of probability. 50% probability, 75%, 80%, 90%, whatever. And the higher the probability, the more certain we are that it's likely to be true. He says the chief deductive reasoning is derived from a conclusion of something we know is absolutely true. Now, <clears throat> I would argue <clears throat> that the scriptures are, are certainly true. 
and so I can d derive their deductive conclusions from them. Of course, atheists won't agree with that, but that's where I began with my reasoning. The chief criterion for evaluating explanation is relevance. It has to be relevant. Now, he's going to explain relevance later. We'll come back to it later. The re relevance of a proposed explanation then corresponds exactly to the cogency of the argument of which the fact to be explained is inferred from the proposed explanation. The most obvious requirement to propose is that the explanation be true, but that's almost axiomatic, self-evident. And it has to be true. If it's not true, then we can't prove anything from it. He goes on and describes science for us. He says science is supposed to be concerned with facts, yet in its further reaches, he said, now watch this. And yet in its further reaches, we find it apparently committed to highly speculative notions, far removed from the possibility to direct evident experience. Now he's going to define science a little bit later as something I, I can know from my senses by empirical means, by one of my five senses. Now <clears throat> I'm going to take our senses to be five senses. We have a sense of uh, feeling, but we can subdivide that into touch, pressure, temperature, and so forth. There are several different senses we can sense with our sensors. We have the sense of smell. We have the smell of something that's putrid, uh, that's sweet smelling. And we have different uh, sensors for smelling. Now we have taste. We have different sensors for tasting. And seeing, we see maybe different colors even. And, and hearing, of course, we can hear different tones and pitches. Uh, but I'm going to list it just as five senses. I won't subdivide them. So we'll just talk about the five senses. So that will be, it has to be by direct experience. By direct experience, and that's the key. This word experience is the key. Or scientific knowledge. It has to be experienced to be true science. These speculative notions are not true science, that's my comment, until they're shown to be probably true by the scientific method by empirical means. <clears throat> empirical means by, by our senses. Now here's a continuing a quote of, of Kopi. Every explanation in science is put forth tentatively and provisionally. It's tentative. We're dealing with probabilities. Something is probably true. Uh, when I was uh, doing graduate work, I learned that if you did a doctoral dissertation and you found out that you had a probability of 90% or better, that was generally acceptable, that you, your, your hypothesis was proven to a 90% probability, that was highly acceptable. If it was more than 90%, that's even better. Any proposed explanation is regarded as a mere hypothesis. This is a quote of right here from, and I broke the, every sentence up right here into different, uh, on this on this slide, this is continuing quote. Any proposed explanation regarded as a mere hypothesis but I define what a hypothesis is. I would put it in simple terms as an educated guess, all right, um, and for our purposes right now, more or less probable on the basis of available facts or relevant evidence. So it's more or less probable. So the proposed explanation is regarded as a hypothesis. It's tentative, it's provisional, and it's a hypothesis must be admitted that the scientist's vocabulary, still quoting Kopi, is a little misleading on this point. What he says is, when what we was first suggested as a hypothesis becomes well confirmed, it is frequently elevated the position of a theory. So if they get more and more evidence for it, they call it a theory, All right? Now, the evidence has to be scientific evidence. It needs to be. When on the basis of a great mass of evidence, they get a lot of evidence, it achieves well not universal acceptance, promoted the lofty status of a law. Right? So we go through supposedly these three stages. 
However, this he says that they're kind of loose with their terminology. Vocabulary of hypothesis theory and law is unfortunate since it obscures the important fact that all of the general propositions of science are regarded as hypotheses, never as dogmas. When they call it a law, they're dogmatically saying it has to be true. And he's saying they're never dogmas. All right. He goes on and says, since every standard explanation regarded as hypothesis is regarded as worthy of acceptance, only to the extent that there's evidence for it. I'll digress just a moment. Why in the world are they spending billions of dollars to check out the soil on Mars to see if there's organisms there? What do you think that's all about? They're trying to give some evidence that organic microevolution occurred. <laughs> that's what this is all about. <laughs> I don't think they're going to find anything. Now, they'll talk about organic molecules, but that's deceptive. These are molecules that organisms are made out of. It's not a molecule that's made by an organism. It's molecules that, that uh, organisms are made from, made out of, but it's not something made by an organism. All right, kind of keep that in mind. So they may talk about finding organic molecules on Mars, and uh, they may find some. Carbon dioxide could become an organic molecule in the sense that it is something that uh, plants are made out of. They take it in and make make a part of their stems and leaves out of it. But we'll, we'll, I'll quit my, cease my digression. Uh, I think you're going to find uh, they're seek, seeking on Mars, trying to find evidence that there was life there. As a hypothesis, back to Kopi, uh, the question of its truth or falsehood is open. It's an open question, see right there. And there's continual search for more and more evidence to decide the question. What they do is they test it again and again. And we'll go through this, but it's negative. The testing is negative, and I'll show you why it is as we develop this. And when we get into the logic course next semester, you'll see it in great, great detail why it has to be negative. The term evidence is used here refers ultimately to the experience. That key word is experience right there. Sensible evidence is, is the only record of the field in verifying scientific propositions. And so it has to be experienced. Now, I would, if that's the case, and that, that is the case with true science, it, it's empirical, it has to be experienced. How in the world can they claim to scientifically proven that the universe started with the Big Bang? There was no human there to see it. <laughs> and they they cannot experience it. We can't reproduce the creation of the universe. We're just not able to do that. And we can't observe it occurring. We can theorize, but that's nothing but a hypothesis with no chance of testing or of using experience to verify it. It is unverifiable by science. And it's just a it's just a hypothesis. Is all it is. Not a theory. They like to call it a theory, but that's playing with the words. Science is empirical in holding that sense experience is the test of truth for all its pronouncements. They it have to sense it. At the beginning of life, they want to find evidence that life began in other places like Mars. I don't think they're going to find anything there. They'll find what they call organic molecules, and that'll fool some people. But it's not life. Consequently, he goes on and says, it is of the essence of scientific proposition, of a scientific proposition that it be capable of being tested by observation. Can't observe the beginning of can't observe the beginning of life. All right. Now they've modified the DNA of living organisms, and I think they're messing with stuff they shouldn't be messing with. But they have done that. And that hasn't created new life. It's modified existing life. He goes on and says some propositions can be tested directly, and he goes on and lists some. But the propositions which scientists use to offer as explanatory hypotheses are not of this type. Many of them cannot be tested. 
directly. There's indirect that they can, however, be tested indirectly. Now, the pattern of indirect testing or indirect verification consists of two parts. And this is what we get into indirect. First one deduces from the proposition to be tested one or more other propositions which are capable of being tested directly. So we deduce, we draw conclusions from it, and we deduce things from it. We'll have to see what we mean by deducing. Then these conclusions are tested and found to be either true or false. All right? If the conclusions are false, any proposition which implies it must be false also. <clears throat> So we, we do that kind of reasoning when we teach and preach the, in from the Bible. The Bible uses that kind of reason. On the other hand, it will come back to it. And this is important, kind of file that in the back of your mind. We're gonna elaborate on that in more detail for, before the night's over. On the other hand, if the conclusions are true, this provides evidence for the truth of the proposition being tested, which is thus confirmed indirectly. Now, when he says confirmed, just because we get one conclusion is true doesn't mean that the proposition has been proven. I'll go back to that later. So you must kind of keep in mind, and he'll clarify this later. It should be noted that indirect testing is never demonstrative or certain. He tells us in the next sentence. It's never demonstrative or certain. All you're doing is giving more probability that it's true. You've increased the probability. You haven't determined certainty or you haven't demonstrated it to be true. You've shown likelihood of it being true. Likelihood as the more propositions you test, the greater the confidence that it's true. To deduce directly testable conclusions from a proposition usually requires additional premises. Sometimes you have to draw more premises. Similarly, establishing the truth of a conclusion does not demonstrate the truth of the premises. That's what I'm saying here. We'll get back to it in just a minute. We have to let, we have to clarify that in more detail. That's critical. That is a very critical point. And so let me say that again. Similarly, move my mouse. Establishing the truth of a conclusion does not demonstrate the truth of the premises from which it was deduced. I want to give you an illustration. I'm going to digress just a minute. <clears throat> if I say if a, an internal combustion engine is running, then it has fuel. Is that a true statement? If it is running, it has fuel. That, uh, that is a true statement. All right. So I can say if this engine is running, it has fuel, some kind of fuel. I'm not saying what kind of fuel, but it has some kind of fuel. Something has to combust in order to make that engine run. It could be diesel, it could be gasoline, it could be natural gas, propane, something to that effect. Hydrogen can burn, right? So it has to be, it has to have a fuel. Now then, if I come over here and say, if it is running, it has fuel, that's true. But if I say, if it has fuel, it's running, that's not necessarily true. I've had my car engine to have fuel in the tank and it wouldn't run. Now, does that make sense? You can't take it the other direction, all right? So keep that in mind. That's just a simple illustration, all right, of it. All right, so let's go back here now. That's why you do this. Similarly, step the truth inclusion does not demonstrate the truth of the premises from which it was deduced. So if you take the conclusion, it has it has fuel and say, therefore it's running, you can't draw that conclusion. It has to have spark plugs and on and on. We can note other things. If it's a gasoline engine, for example, it would have to have spark plugs. Diesel wouldn't have to, but we'd have certain things it would have to have, some kind of a mechanism to put the fuel into the combustion chamber, see? We could say other things that would have to be there for it to operate, depending on the nature of the engine. We know very well that a valid argument may have a true conclusion, even though its premises are not true. And I'll show examples of that. Right? We can we can show that as well. 
So the inferred conclusion might be true, even though the premises from which it was deduced were, were not, All right? Now, the conclusion could be true, but the premises are not necessarily true, All right? Now we'll show examples of that later. In the usual case though, that is, that is highly unlikely. So a successful or affirmative direct testing of a conclusion serves to corroborate the premises from which it was declared, shows the likelihood, and what he means by that is the likelihood increases that the premise is true, but you haven't proven the premise. All right? If I have fuel, there's a greater likelihood the engine's gonna run. <laughs> And if I don't have fuel, it won't run. So the likelihood goes up. It must be admitted that every proposition, scientific or unscientific, which is a relevant explanation of observable fact. So that when we say observable fact, something has to be observable. The beginning of the universe, beginning of life, and so forth is not observable. It has some evidence in its favor. So there's going to be some evidence there. We've examined the evidence. See? namely the fact to which it is relevant. Here then is the difference between scientific and unscientific explanations, right? That was a scientific explanation for a given fact or to have directly testable propositions deducible from it, okay? Other than the one exerting the fact to be explained. So we can draw other conclusions from it. But an unscientific explanation will have no other directable, directly testable proposition deducible from it. He gives several illustrations from scientific claims, claims of certain things that occurred. It is the essence of scientific proposition to be empirically verifiable. We keep coming back to empirically verifiable. And look the word up empirically, that's with your senses, your five senses, two, one or more of your five senses. That's all it is. And if you have questions, just stop me and ask me. Let's so go through this. Since this treatise, this is my points, has set forth a theistic explanation of many of the geologic formations of the Earth, it's imperative that we determine how we can properly evaluate scientific evidence. I'm claiming the Bible allows this interpretation. And in fact, I think it pretty well demands the interpretation I've given. However, I am not dogmatic on it. I've drawn the conclusions based upon the evidence that I've examined. I think there's scientific evidence to back up what I'm saying happened. Is there scientific evidence that supports the Fox flood model? I think there is. That's what we want to be examining in the next two or three lessons. The, the question naturally arises as to how scientific explanation will be evaluated. This is back to Kopi, judged as good or bad, or at least better or worse. How do we make a judgment of whether they're good or bad or if one's better than another? The question is especially important because there is usually more than one single, than a single scientific explanation for one and the same fact. Sometimes there's more than one explanation. Let me point out. We have in the living organisms, area of living organisms, we have animals that have backbones, some don't. And they say, well, they must have evolved from one another, not necessarily, because a creator might have found the backbone to be a good usage, good tool to use in various kinds of animals. And he may have put the backbone in them for that reason because it's a, fun it's a functional thing, it's very functional. And uh, so that doesn't necessarily mean that they're all made by the same person. And we can, we can get into mechanical apparatuses that are not necessarily made by the same person. But a man may make different apparatuses and use similar designs, all right? And one didn't create the other one. No one has ever pretended to lay down a set of rules, Kofi goes on and says, for the invention or discovery of hypotheses. How do you draw a, a conclusion or a hypothesis? How do you 
figure out this is what I'm going to test. It's likely that none to be laid down, for that is a creative side of the scientific enterprise. I don't claim to be creative in this because what I've done is tried to take what the Bible says and use it as my guidelines. I've used that as a guideline for forming my hypothesis. And it, uh, I won't draw any hypotheses that contradicts the Bible. And I've just gone with that with the information that I've, that I've obtained by my studies. Ability to create is a function of imagination and talent cannot be reduced to a mechanical process. That's probably true, right? There's no formula for discovering new hypotheses, but there are certain rules which acceptable hypotheses can be expected to conform. So now when we, we have a hypothesis, we need to check it out and there are rules that we need to conform to, it needs to conform to. These can be regarded as the criteria for evaluating hypotheses. So now we're gonna look at, all right, now we've got these hypotheses. My hypothesis, my hypothesis is that the Fox flood model that I've set forth in this book is the most reasonable explanation for many, many, many geologic and astronomical uh, criteria, things that we find and uh, facts that we see out there in nature. We're going to look at the five criteria commonly used in judging the worth or acceptability of hypotheses as we continue copy. They may be listed as, and he lists them here, relevance, number one, number two, testability, number three, compatibility with previously well-established hypotheses. All right. In other words, can we find other scientific information that would back it up? Is there that is does it conform with principles of science that we are fairly confident are correct? Uh, I'll just digress again. Uh, we find that gophers and burrowing animals usually have two uh, two entrances to their tunnels, and one of the entrances is that on higher ground. If the ground is level, they'll they'll raise up one of those entrances with a mound. And why do they do that? Well, because those little critters were reading about Brunelli's principle, which will explain how the air moving across one of the tunnels, the mounded up one will suck the, will, will actually create a vacuum there and pull the, pull the, the gases and carbon dioxide in particular out of the tunnel and put fresh air into the tunnel. Now, those little critters read the physics books, I'm sure, and they figured that out. I think God created them that way, gave them that, that uh, ability to determine it and made them so that they would dig their tunnels that way. But let's go back. And so we have well-established hypotheses compatible, so it has to be compatible. And so I would say, my hypothesis is with regard to the burying animals that Almighty God put in them, in those in those creatures, He put them that that uh, ability to do that, and so that is an instinct that was put in them, put in them by God the Creator. And I don't think an atheist has an answer to it. And they certainly didn't read the physics books to learn about Prentice's principle. Okay, but let's move on. I can go on and on with stuff like that. Predictive and explanatory power can we make predictions from this model of other things that we could check and test? I'm going to make at least three, three, probably four, five, or six predictions of things that I think we can find and we can test my model. And they haven't been checked yet. And I will set forth predictions as to what they will find if they if they check it. Right. And of course. Is it simple? The simplicity of it. The, the more complicated it is, uh, it usually uh, less likely to be true, but not necessarily true. It may be very complicated. We don't realize it, but I, simplicity is one of the things they look for. Now, Kofi defines relevance. He means that it must be deducible from the hypothesis. So we must be able to logically derive the conclusion that it's true. 
by testable, he means that it must be possible to test hypothesis by empirical means. There must be some observable fact that we logically deduce from it, and we can observe that fact and see it in operation. Right. Regarding compatibility with previously well established hypotheses, Copey wrote, although the ideal, ideal of science, not idea, but ideal, this is the ideal case, may be the gradual growth of theoretical knowledge. This is what we think in, in ideal, idealistic terms. He says, by the addition of one new hypothesis after another, we draw a hypothesis, we draw another one, we just keep expanding the knowledge. The actual history of scientific progress not always followed this pattern. It hasn't been the case. Many of the most important new hypotheses have been inconsistent with older theories and have, in fact, replaced them rather than fitted in with them. I remember when I was a boy, I used to hear people uh, getting shocked. They say, you got a lot of juice. Well, <laughs> Electricity was thought to be like a fluid, and that's how they first uh, depicted it as a fluid. And they went from a high pressure to a low pressure area. And so they would have the electricity flowing from plus to minus. Well, electrons actually flow the other direction. Okay. But uh, again, it's electric fields that are moving in the first place, and they move the electrons. That's certainly true. But, uh, Okay, so right here now, many of the most important ones, uh, they just had the wrong idea about it. Uh, they used to have the pre-formation theory of, of birth. They thought men supplied uh, a tiny human being in a semen, and the woman provided a fertile field for it to grow. Called pre-formation, P-R-E-F-O-R-M-A-T-O-N, pre-formation -pre theory. Well, the Bible all along said that women had a, a seed, okay? But some claim the Bible was wrong because it said women had a seed, which now we know women have a seed, they have an egg. And men have a sperm which join and form a baby. Regarding predictive or explanatory power, it's going to have to predict it, he says. One of two testable hypotheses has a greater number of observable facts deducible from it than from the other, and then it's said to be a greater predictive or explanatory power. One that has can predict the most things and they be true is the most likely to be true. And I'm going to show that my model predicts more than the atheistic model and shows them to be true. It predicts more facts that are true than the atheistic model. An observable fact that can be deduced from a given hypothesis said to be explained by it also can be said to be predicted by it. Our fourth criterion has a negative side, which is of crucial importance. Keep this in mind. Now, this is a flag. You gotta listen. If a hypothesis is consistent with any well attested fact of, of observation, hypothesis is false and must be rejected. So if we find that it contradicts some fact we know, then it ought to be rejected. Let me take the hypothesis of organic microevolution. It contradicts the well-attested fact of the law of biogenesis. All living things come from other living things. <laughs> and the Big Bang Theory contradicts a simple principle of mathematics. You don't get zero plus zero and get 20. You can't add nothing to nothing and get something. Can't happen. And it's just ludicrous. I think that both of them are utterly ludicrous because of that. The fourth criterion is basically a modus tollens argument now. So we're going to have to see what a modus tollens argument is. And these are if then statements. Modus tollens argument is valid form, argument of the form here. And I use S's and N's. Uh, most logicians use P's and Q's. I don't like P's and Q's. I use S and M, and I'll explain why that here in just a moment. Uh, if S is true, then N is true. And they argue then N is not true. Then, therefore, S is not true. Now, let me just use this back to our automobile engine. If the automobile engine is running, Right, then there is fuel 
being fed to the engine. That's true. Has to have some fuel. I don't know what kind of fuel, but it has to have fuel. The engine has no fuel being fed. There is no fuel feed being fed to the engine. Conclusion, the engine is not running. <laughs> That's a conclusion I can draw. If it doesn't get any fuel, it won't run. That's that's a given, and that's pretty simple. And so right here, that is an argument. So what we do is we say, okay, if I'm on a dag, I'm gonna look at my car engine and see whether it's running or not. It's not running. So I say, okay, I'm gonna check. Maybe it doesn't have any. Maybe it has doesn't have any fuel. So I check it and find the fuel, and I say, well, that's not the answer. And I check and say, well, maybe the fuel pump is not working or the injectors aren't working. I check them, they're working. I say, that's not my problem. Then I say, okay, I've, I've taken two hypotheses and, and, and proven both of them to be false. I take another hypothesis. I say, okay, maybe uh, the ignition is not working. So I check my ignition and sure enough, it's not working. Then I fix it and the car runs. See how simple that is? A good mechanic operates through and, and does that process. That's precisely what he does. And he goes through it that way. And a woman may bake a cake and or make a cake and it doesn't come out right. And she says, okay, she goes back and looks at what she put in the cake. And she says, well, uh, why not put sugar? Well, I did, I did put sugar. Maybe she filmed herself baking it for some reason. And she goes back and looks through and again and again, she finds, oh, I didn't put the sugar in it. Or I didn't put this in it, this item or whatever. And she finds out what was not there. So she hypothesizes, I didn't put this in, checks it, and what was there, and then goes through it. Same way I'm, I'm troubleshooting my automobile. Same basic principle. And the scene of this hypothetical conditional syllogism is S. It's anti, A-N-T, that's Latin for before. Antecedent goes before. So there's your antecedent, S. I call that, it has to be a sufficient condition. That's why I put the letter S for it. If the S is true, then N is true. The consequent, that's what comes after the word then, is N, it's a necessary condition. We're gonna explain this more fully. So I would always write mine as F, S, then N. And the end is not true in this case. I'm denying the consequent. And that that disproves the antecedent. If there's no fuel, the car can't be running. Does that make sense? Any questions anyone has? All right. More questions? All right. Each of these equivalent sentences claims that the antecedent expresses a sufficient condition for the consequent and claims that the consequent expresses a necessary condition for the antecedent. Now, this is another logic book by Barker. And so page 97 of Barker. And again, I cite these and I sent this material to all of you tonight before class. Barker explained both necessary and sufficient conditions. Now, let's look at how he defines them. Barker defines, this is a quote of Barker, by saying that B is a necessary condition for C, we mean that nothing is a case for C that is not being a case for B. Right? And so B is a necessary condition for C. Fuel is a necessary condition to have a running uh, internal combustion engine that's running. So nothing is a case of C without being a case of B. No internal combustion engine can be running without fuel. Say okay, that's B, your fuel. All right. Here by saying that B is a sufficient condition for C. I'm saying B is your internal combustion engine is running, then it proves it's got fuel. Okay. If it's running, I know it's got fuel. All right. So that's that fuel to run. I mean that anything that is a case for B is a case for C. So if the engine's running, it's got fuel. I don't have to worry about it. It's running, it's got fuel. I can prove that. For example, being at least now, he used a simpler example than my car engine running. 
being at least 30 years old is a necessary, but not a sufficient condition for being a United States Senator. Our constitution says all US senators shall be at least 30 years old, 30 years of age or older. You cannot be a, a duly elected US Senator, United States Senator, and be less than 30 years old. You cannot be, and be elected, not unless you cheated somehow and lied about your age or something like that. And you won't, wouldn't be duly elected, right? So being at least 30 years old is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for being a United States Senator. Just because I'm more than 30 years old doesn't mean I'm a U.S. Senator. <laughs> I've never been a United States Senator. I'm definitely over 30 years of age. So that doesn't prove. So you can't turn it around and go the other way. All right? Keep that in mind. Just because the car has fuel doesn't mean it's running. All right? Okay, so keep that in mind now. Hurley, another book, and I recommend Hurley, is a very excellent book. Uh, is good, and so is Bank Barker. Uh, these are all good logic books. Hurley discussed the necessary and sufficient conditions. He gives illustrations. I'll, I'll give some more illustrations because these are critical. Conditional statements are especially important in logic because they express the relationship between necessary and sufficient conditions. So a conditional statement, if then, if P then Q, or if S then M, uh, express a relationship between necessary and sufficient conditions. A is said to be a sufficient condition for B whenever the occurrence of A is all that is needed for the occurrence of B. <clears throat> I'll go back here. If I say a man is a United States Senator, and I'm saying that's sufficient to prove he's 30 years, if he's a duly elected United States Senator, it's proof that he's at least 30 years of age. If my memory's right, to be president, you have to be 35. I can't remember, but I think our constitution says you have to be 35 years old. And so if you're a duly elected president, you have to be whatever that minimum age is to be president. So, a is said to be a sufficient condition for B whenever the occurrence of A is all that is needed for the occurrence of B. I could say if, if a man is a Christian, then I can guarantee he believes in Jesus as Christ, the Son of God. And I can guarantee that that would be a sufficient to say it is, if he's truly a Christian, then I could say he believes in Jesus to be the Christ, the Son of God. I can say other things about him, but I can say that and say more. I can test other hypotheses. I can say, if I'm saying, I'm trying to prove he's a Christian, I can say, does he believe in Jesus is Christ? If he said no, and I say he's not a Christian. I say, okay, he believes, that's not necessarily sufficient. That has he repented, has he been baptized and so forth? We can go on and list other things. Does he love God? Does he love his neighbor as himself? These are all conditions for being truly a Christian. Let's go back here now. A is said to be a sufficient condition for B whenever the occurrence of A is all that is needed for the occurrence of B. For example, being a Drake, he goes on and tells us, this is Hurley, a Drake, that's a male duck, is a sufficient condition for being a male. Why? because all drakes are males, okay? On the other hand, B is said to be a necessary condition for A whenever it, it, A cannot occur without the occurrence of B. Thus being a male is a necessary condition for being a drake, see? So being a male is necessary. So if this duck is a drake, it's a male, because being a male is a necessary condition for being a drake. Now, if I say it is not a male, then I say it's not a drake. I've denied this. If being a drake is a male, then he's not a male. He can't be a drake. See, any questions? Event A is said to be a sufficient condition for event B whenever the occurrence of A is all that is required for the occurrence of B. All that's required. And we go back to being a, a senator. <laughs>
I can guarantee if it's a dude that likes dinner, he's at least 30 years of age. If he hasn't cheated somehow, duly elected. On the other hand, the event A is said to be a necessary condition for event B, whenever B cannot occur without the occurrence of A. All right, let's go back to being a senator. If he's a duly elected senator, he has to be 30 years of age. So if he's not 30 years of age, he cannot be a duly elected senator. So the necessary condition, A is said to be necessary, being 30 years of age is necessary to be a senator. So you can't be a senator without being 30 years of age, without A. Right? To translate statements involving sufficient necessary conditions in symbolic form, place the statement that names the sufficient condition in the antecedent of the conditional and the statement that names the necessary condition in the consequent. Now, we will look at this in the logic class that will start in January, about six weeks or six or seven weeks from now. Okay. The scientific method employs the following Otis Tolland's argument. Here it is. If the hypothesis, the sufficient condition is true, then the observable consequent, the necessary condition must be true. Okay. So if the hypothesis is true, the observable consequent must be true. All right. The observable consequent, the necessary condition, is not true. And if they show that it's not true, then that destroys the hypothesis and they need to form a new hypothesis. What they're looking for again and again is the test that will destroy their hypothesis or disprove it. And in which case they have to reform a new hypothesis. That's basically what they're doing. Conclusion hypothesis condition, sufficient condition is not true because we've disproven it by finding an instance where it doesn't work. If you could find me one bona fide senator that was duly elected, that was less than 30 years of age, without it violating the Constitution, which can't be done, you would disprove my hypothesis that all senators are 30 years of age or older. All do the elected senators are. So, because we have a hard, fast rule, you can't find that. But in science, you frequently your hypotheses are tested and can be found to be false. The preformation theory of birth was found to be false. Why? Because both men and women provide a, an egg cell, a, a germ cell, an egg and a sperm. Or half of the half of the DNA comes from the mother and half of it comes from the father on average. And so the preformation theory is the hypothesis was actually disproven. And so we have to have a new theory about how how birth occurs or how conception occurs. Now let's come back here now. Why do we have this? We cannot do what is called affirming the consequent the observable consequence and prove the antecedent of the hypothesis to be true. That's why they, they always frame it in negative form because it would, it would form an invalid and improperly constructed argument. All invalid arguments are unsound. Affirming the consequent is a logical fallacy and won't prove anything. Let me show you this. It's why the scientific method employs the modus Tollum's argument it takes and denies the consequent. The unsound form is this. Here's an unsound argument. If the hypothesis condition is true, then the observable consequent, the necessary condition must be true. That's a good statement. There's nothing wrong with that. All right. The observable consequent, the necessary condition is true. All right. That might even be a true statement. And then we cannot draw the conclusion however, the hypothesis sufficient condition is true. I go back to my automobile engine. I can say if the engine is running, that's my hypothesis, my sufficient condition. Then we have fuel being fed to the engine. That's a true statement. That is true. 
Suppose we have fuel being fed to the engine. Does that mean it's running? No, it doesn't. Okay, doesn't mean it. Does not mean it's going to run or is running. So you can't affirm the consequent and prove the antecedent. Right? You can deny the consequent and deny the antecedent, but you can't affirm the consequent, and that proves nothing about the antecedent. But it takes more than fuel running to make that up internal combustion engine run. So what they do is they'll say, here's all the things that would have followed if my hypothesis is true, we'd start testing them. We test one and it comes out to be true. I didn't prove my, my uh, hypothesis. I didn't disprove it, see. I've tested again and it didn't get disproven. I tested over and over and over with different things that are predicted from it. The more things that I check, the more likely it is that my hypothesis is correct. I just check it with different things that ought to come from it. And the more things that I can predict that should come and they do come, I fail to disprove my hypothesis. And so indirectly, I have shown it to be more credible, but it didn't prove it. It just showed more credibility for it. We're dealing with a negative argument. And that's what it has to be. It's a self-evident truth. It's axiomatic that the scientists would have to both know every observable consequent that was implied by its hypothesis and test by observing it in nature or arranged laboratory situation to test it. You'd have to test every observable consequence in order to be certain of the hypothesis. Now, the more things he tests, the greater certainty he has that is correct. I think some things are tested over and over and over, and they can they can function. Now, let me point out: if you have confidence that Bernoulli's principle is true, you may get in an airplane and fly. Okay, Bernoulli's principle, principle by which an airplane wing gives you lift. But what we have here is I've flown in airplanes. I've flown to Russia and I've flown to England and I've flown to Jamaica and I've flown to Africa. All these places I've flown to, I had confidence that Bernoulli's principle was correct and I got there and back. So that principle has been tested over and over and over. Is it absolutely certain that it's true? Well, the certainty is almost 100% certainty. It's, it's so probable that we just treat it like it's true. But even then, there might be some situation where it wouldn't work. I don't know what it'd be, but I, I just go on like it's true. And I think God expects us to deal with stuff in that way. But this is one of the problems we get into with our reason. This is why Copy wrote the following. Now we'll go back to Copy now. See, he says this. Since every scientific explanation is regarded as a hypothesis, it's regarded as worthy of acceptance only to the extent that it, there's evidence for it. Bernoulli's principle has airplanes have flown all over the millions of miles, and it still works. And so I say Bernoulli's principle is certainly, I just, I trust it. <laughs> I trust, I'll get in an airplane and fly. I'm not afraid of it. Because I think that's how God made birds fly and other things fly. And it works. As a hypothesis, the question of its truth or falsehood is open. Even Bernoulli's principle, they would say, is not absolutely proven. But the certainty is so high a probability that we just operate as if it's true. And there's a continual search for more and more evidence to decide the question. We keep trying to disprove it. You know, they may find a situation where Bernoulli's principle does not work. They may find one. I don't know, but they might. If they do, then Bernoulli's principle will be still in the books and there'll be an exception to it listed in the books because it's worked so much and so far. And they may try to frame a new law that takes care of the new uh, exception that they find. That's what happened with the new Newtonian mechanics. They used 
uh, Einstein's relativity, general relativity, general theory of relativity, he used it to modify Newton's laws. Newton's laws work, but uh, they found some situations where they don't exactly work. But that's another question. We'll not get off into that any further. Lee was correct. Lee was the book that we cited earlier. Uh, it deals with scientific method and, and the use of science. Because all scientific statements must be considered as best only tentatively correct, the phrase scientific proof should be used with extreme caution in scientific discussion. Strictly speaking, nothing in science is truly proved. I guess you have to say even Bernoulli's principle is not proved. Uh, I've used certain laws of electricity, Ohm's law and so forth, Joule's law, and I've shown them to be true over and over and over. I've used computers to measure them and they come out. We measure with a computer, measure the value over thousands of times, and it works. It just works again and again and again. Get we, the, the law works. And I'm confident that the law is true. There may be exceptions, however, we haven't found. Copy's fifth criteria is simplicity. Let's look at this. One's knowledge of history is based upon knowledge not gained by empirical means. Geology is based upon history. The past can be reached in only two ways. And this is Cohen and Nagel. That's a, a research book that I use in working with a doctorate degree. The past can be reached in only two ways, either through the personal memory of the historian or through the interpretation of objects as remains of past events. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to be using interpretation of objects as remains of past events to verify my flood with scientific arguments from that. It would be basically historical. And it's not actually science in the sense that it's observed. We're seeing evidence for it. The purpose of historical research is to reconstruct the past objectively and accurately, often in relation to tenability, tenability of, a, of a hypothesis. And that's Isaac and Michael their book, their handbook on this discussion. This is the same method of determining truth used in a courtroom. It's called prima facie evidence of, or knowledge, like we'd use in the courtroom. I believe that kind of knowledge is what we see in the Bible. We see that kind of knowledge. Uh, we don't experience the miracles that Jesus worked. We don't experience the prophecies. We can look at them being fulfilled. That gives us confidence that it was written by God because old man can't know the future. Any area of science that deals with things that cannot be either reproduced in the laboratory or observed in nature is usually based on statistical inference. We have to use statistics. And here, even conclusions derived from things that are or can be observed are based on statistical inference. Roth, who was an atheist, wrote that geology and paleontology, paleontology is the study of fossils, are historical sciences and that these sciences rely largely on statistical inference or using statistics. Statistics gives prob probability. You never get a probability of 100%, you may be 99.99% or something like that, but your probability is never 100%. You're never absolutely certain that it's true. Both geologists and paleontologists must look at the artifacts and then form a hypothesis to explain them. They test their hypothesis. Geologists and paleontologists will likely be biased by their worldview, either atheist, agnostic, or theistic. A geologist may be, may be a theist, may believe in God. He may be an old earth theist, a, a believer in God, or he may believe, uh, be a young earth. And they both draw different conclusions. He may be atheistic or agnostic, and he'll have different backgrounds. The worldview that you have, the view of things, will affect how you will view the evidence. Your worldview is your view of things. Do you believe there's a God? Yes or no? My worldview is theistic. I see things 
as being created by God and controlled by God. I say God exists. In many instances, the evidence would lead to him to more than one conclusion. We've already seen quotes from some of these writers that claim that there's more than one possible explanation. When geologists observe present day processes and either extrapolate them back in time or interpolate between the events, they're making uniformitarian assumptions. But we showed in one of the first lesson or two that uniformitarianism has been rejected by modern geologists, yet they fall back on the uniformitarian assumptions in their extrapolation. The mo most present day geologists have rejected uniformitarian principles, yet they use uniformitarian principles to form their hypotheses and to test them. Let me, let me give you this and we'll close our lesson. The scientific method tests hypotheses by seeking to disprove the hypothesis. So what we're going to do, we're going to do that with my front model. Since the scientific method always uses, it, it's all, it's, it's always uses, and that should be used instead of using Bodas Tala's arguments. It cannot conclusively arrive at truth because of the nature of because of its nature, the nature of the argument. All truth derived from the scientific method is tentative. It's only probably true with varying amounts of probability. This concludes our lesson. Any questions or comments? Okay.